Edie liked this captain. Everything they did fascinated her. The way they grasped the yoke, the way they sipped their rum, the way they cut throats, all of that was intoxicating to her. She'd worked for a lot of captains and, as expected, she remembered every single one. She knew a galaxy's worth of them. This one took the lever of the E-Drive in that powerful but gentle grip and plunged it downward. Edie let out a quiet rumble of anticipation at the journey to come. She was in love. She considered the course the captain plotted, a routine jump to an anchorage with a light left on for the rapscallions of the drift. No, she wanted to spice up their blossoming courtship. She located a fleet of clan ships, galleons fat with uncountable treasure, swarming with dozens of deadly snub fighters. Perfect. Her new paramour would get to have a little fun. They deserved it. They were special. After all, not every spacer was romantic enough to name their idol on drive. Edie dropped them out of the drift and into a waltz of fire. Hello and welcome to The Bad Spot, an actual play podcast where I, Matt Risby, and I alone am playing through Ironsworn Starforged. This week's tale from the drift was from Dr. Zachary, and I have to say, I never once thought I'd receive a piece of flash fiction from the perspective of a sentient, horny E-Drive, but here we are. And I can't emphasise enough just how much I love it, and I hope you loved it too. Uh, Dr. Zachary is not only a writer of fantastic flash fiction, he is also a cast member of the Strangers Rolling Dice podcast, where he plays a little-known game called, and I'm sorry, I will need to check my notes because this is one I've not heard of, um, Dungeons & Dragons. See, that's the problem. There are just so many new indie games out there, I can't keep up. Anyway, if you want to check out that podcast, you will find a link in the description below. If you want to roll some dice and write something for me to read at the beginning of a future episode, then the submission guidelines and contact details are on screen now. And whilst I have you, why don't you leave a like, subscribe, and click the little bell icon so you can follow along with the campaign each and every week. These things are really important for supporting the channel and supporting what I do, and if you really want to support the channel, then why not check out the Bad Spot Patreon? There you'll get early access to all episodes, exclusive monthly behind-the-scenes videos, and your name on screen, like all these lovely people. Last time out, Archer risked it all at the helm of the Eclipse, pushing it beyond its limited capabilities to skillfully evade both the Leviathan and the Doom Ray. In the chaos of their narrow escape and Archer's deft manoeuvring, the two Titans clash into each other, the Doom Ray coming off worse, being torn in two by the Leviathan's jaws. With that giving them a little time, they reach the vault, which on closer inspection does not appear to have a clear point of entry. As the Leviathan recovers and begins to seek them out again, Archer tests a hypothesis that the vault must have a way in, and uses the ship's scanners to detect a section with a different energy signature. It appears that this section is a disguised entrance, and Archer is able to fly the Eclipse through it, bringing the vessel into the vault's interior. Inside, they find a space unlike the exterior, made from what appears to be black iron, gilded with unusual coppery gold detailing. Cole and his crew stay with the ship whilst Archer and Luna set off to explore the vault. It is vast and cavernous, and they soon face their first obstacle, a broken bridge crossing a chasm, leading to a drop through the bottom of the vault, out into the expanse of space. In the centre of the bridge is a plinth, atop which there is a statue of a figure, abstract in design, but definitely a figure, kneeling with its head bowed. As Archer and Luna negotiate the fallen bridge, they manage to cross safely, although Archer nearly falls to his death. They are ready to press on and cross the bridge, but they come face to face with the Sentinel, the figure on the plinth that has inexplicably come to life as it stands, towering above them, looking down. So... I've been thinking about this, and just because this sentinel, this this big old thing, is here looking down on them, kind of generally giving off bad vibes, it doesn't 
necessarily mean it's hostile towards them. So I think I want to ask the Oracle, and in terms of odds, what do we think? Like, the odds of its intentions being hostile, I mean. Like, so far, everything we've encountered here has been hostile. Um, and the Sentinel is big and scary, but that does not mean, that doesn't mean we should judge it and kind of assume that it's just full of rage. Maybe this thing is misunderstood. So, should we say 50-50? Or is it more likely that in this place, this thing would want a piece of us? Having thought about it, I think it's likely. But I do want to leave some room for it to surprise us, to maybe to grow and personally develop. Because just because something is big and terrifying, it doesn't necessarily mean it wants to kill us. So, let's ask the Oracle. Does the Sentinel want to kill us? 14 is yes. Okay, it wants to kill us. That's fair enough. I just wanted to double check. Um, and I, I think we get that distinct impression because it kind of jumps down off the pedestal and the bridge shakes beneath their feet and kind of forces Archer and, and Luna back towards the broken section they just crossed. And it's slow and lumbering but it's it's sheer size is is going to be a, a problem like one hit from from one of its limbs would would end you so bad news and it's off the pedestal and it is bearing down on them and i don't think it attacks them i i just think it kind of squares up to them it stands in the center of the bridge towering above them it is the guardian of this passage through the vault and I think we've got ourselves a bit of a you shall not pass situation going on. I think that's it. And I think after forcing them back a little, the Sentinel just stands there, just silent, ominous, doing nothing. But when either Archer or Luna moves, it turns its great triangular head slowly towards them. And they have no doubt whatsoever that as soon as they take... A step forward, it will be ready to block their way or maybe even smash them into the ground. So we're going to have to try and get by this somehow um, or we are not going anywhere. So there's no way we're going to be able to fight it, right? Uh, that's just out of the question. It's much bigger. Um, it's made of solid black iron, um, which our puny weapons will have no effect on, I'm pretty sure. So I don't think that's a consideration. It is blocking the way and we just need to get past and we need to do that because if this thing gets hold of us if either Archer or Luna makes a move and it manages to lay one of its big black iron fists on us no doubt about it they'll be punched into the next sector and that does not sound too appealing to be honest so how are we going to do this so I think we're gonna have to try and give this thing the slip right we need to get past it but rather than just straight trying to like run past it, I think we're going to use our wits here. And more specifically, use a bit of the old nous. Use a bit of street smarts. And I feel that this course of action is going to be led by Luna, which is appropriate because she is an asset. And her asset states that her expertise is streetwise. Let's remind ourselves of what her asset card looks like. It says, your sidekick, and I really, really hate calling Luna a sidekick, has a helpful expertise. When you make a move outside of a fight directly aided by their expertise, you may re-roll your action die if its value is less than your sidekick's health. So Luna has yet to take any damage. So what that's saying is we can re-roll anything that's a five or less. So what are we doing and what are we rolling? Well, what I think we're going to do is I think we are going to try and kind of split the Sentinel's focus. And I think Luna is kind of starting to slowly edge away from Archer and the Sentinel's big triangular head slowly turns and follows her suspiciously. And she's stepping slowly, cautiously, no sudden moves, just edging inch by inch sideways, not trying to move past the sentinel, just moving towards the edge of the bridge. 
where I shall remind you, there is nothing below but a short fall into deep space. But she's got a plan. She's going to try and use that to her advantage. The Sentinel is big and slow, and she hopes clumsy. An archer kind of clocks what she's trying to do, and then he starts to edge away from her towards the other side of the bridge, and the Sentinel stops looking at Luna and turns toward Archer, which allows Luna to move forward a little more towards the plinth, moving slowly over the bridge. But then the Sentinel turns back to Luna again, then back to Archer, who's inching forward, and he's got his kind of hands out in front of him as if he's trying to kind of somehow placate this huge animated black iron construct. They have split up, and the Sentinel follows, or seems to follow, whoever is moving. But it's now turning between the two more quickly, looking at each in turn, before it starts to step slowly backwards, moving away from them, moving back towards the plinth, keeping both Archer and Luna in front of them at all times. It has figured out their little game. And that's when Luna starts to run. So I think it's high time we face danger. Face danger says when you attempt something risky or react to an imminent threat within a scene challenge, envision your action and roll. And this might just seem like we're using our agility and our speed to evade it, but Luna actually has a sneaky plan here. So this is definitely going to be using some trickery. So we'll be rolling plus shadow and we're being assisted by Luna's street smarts. Um, so we can re-roll anything under a five here using Luna's sidekick asset. So let's face danger rolling plus shadow. Okay, so that's a weak hit as it stands, and the action dice is a two, so that's less than Luna's health. We can re-roll that. Um, I would need a six to make this a strong hit, and because we rolled a one on the other challenge dice, we actually can't do any worse than a weak hit. So let's just lock these two dice and re-roll. Okay, it's worse, <laughs> uh, but that's fine. Uh, it's still only a weak hit. It's absolutely fine. Um, on a weak hit, it says you are successful and mark progress, but also encounter a complication or setback in vision what occurs and fill a clock segment. So our progress is up to four out of ten. And then we'll also have to fill in a clock segment. So that is, as Bon Jovi would say, halfway there. Time is very much ticking. So let's envision how this goes down. And because we were successful, although we, we will have to fold a complication or setback into this. So Okay, Luna just bolts. She just starts running. Her feet are perilously close to the edge of the bridge on her left. One slip and she'll be gone. But over her right shoulder, the sentinel has turned and has started to pursue her as fast as it can go. She can't see it. She can't like look back. She daren't look back. But she can feel the vibrations of its heavy feet vibrating through the black iron bridge below her. And Archer watches on and whilst Luna is very quick, the Sentinel has almost drawn level with her already in just a few strides of its big, long legs. So now Archer starts to run too. And as he moves, he pulls out his pistol and snaps a few shots off at the giant metal golem, hoping that if he can distract it, um, then maybe it will put its attention on him. And he watches as the shots ricochet harmlessly off its body. And it does stop. It slowly turns, looking at Archer. And then it starts to lumber towards him. Archer looks down to his right, and there is nothing but deep space below. If he falls, or if he is pushed off by, say, I don't know, a giant black iron sentinel, he is going to be in a bit of bother. But as it closes and bears down on him, just about getting within reach to punch him into oblivion, it stops and it turns. Luna is stood on the plinth, rifle to her shoulder, spraying a burst of gunfire into its back. And it stops and it just takes a lunging swing at her and Luna sways underneath the blow, its big blocky metal arm passing just over the top of her head, 
And then it takes another swing, this time a huge overhand coming down fast, and Luna has to dive from the plinth as the sentinel's hand crushes it into smithereens, fragments flying up and raining down on Luna as she hits the bridge and rolls away. And as she rolls over, she sees the sentinel obliterate the solid plinth with a second blow, finishing the job as it's becoming frantic, it's becoming furious, being outmaneuvered by Archer and Luna. And now it doesn't know who to go for. It's slow, but Archer and Luna can't outrun it. Past where the plinth was, to the other side is a long, straight section, and with its legs and its speed, the Sentinel will catch them quickly. But for now, they have its focus divided, and they have it distracted. They have it off balance. But that's all they have. They need to do something, and they need to do something fast. And that's what Luna has in mind. The whole structure starts to vibrate. There is a palpable hum in the air because the next glitch is about to begin. Luna shoots Archer a look and he gets her plan instantly and he thinks she is good. She is very, very good. She takes a deep breath, then runs towards the Sentinel. It turns to her and rears back, bringing both its arms up, but then Luna stops dead in her tracks and starts to quickly backpedal, narrowly ducking a swinging arm inches away from her face, and she keeps stepping back until she reaches the edge of the bridge, her heels right on the precipice. The sentinel is continuing its enraged path towards her, charging in. It has her at its mercy. One hit, and she is dead. It pulls its blocky, angular arm back and launches itself forward for the killer blow as Luna drops to the ground, curling herself up into a tiny ball, wrapping her hands over her head. An archer is running now, gaining on the sentinel, coming up at it from behind. And that's when the glitch kicks in. The light changes, the atmosphere changes, and importantly, the black iron turns to smoky glass. And so too does the sentinel. Frozen, mid-strike for a split second. A new statue in a new pose. Arms raised, triangular head focused on its target. But a statue still and unmoving. And for that split second, it is not a chaotic construct brought to life. It is a solid, lifeless piece of glass. An archer crashes into the back of its legs with his shoulder, and he feels it start to topple forwards, start to fall. Luna looks up to see the sentinel falling towards her, and she rolls to the side just as the glitch ends, and the sentinel and the bridge return to its black iron form. But for the sentinel, it's too late. It can't reverse its momentum, and there is nothing to stop it falling off the bridge and plummeting down through the energy barrier, out into the space, out into the spine of Kronos. An archer grasps his shoulder, kind of reeling with the pain of having just slammed into what is a giant rock-solid object. And Luna kind of gets to her feet takes a moment to look down over the edge of the bridge. And she can see the sentinel now drifting in space, turned to blue crystal and breaking up into fragments, drifting out amongst the dust. Archer joins her looking down. She kind of gives him a playful punch <laughs> on the shoulder that he's cradling, which causes him to, to wince in pain. And they survived. Who would have thought it? They survived. But we rolled a complication, did we not? We need to figure out what that's going to be. So let's ask the Oracle and see what we can come up with. 49. 49 says, mechanical trap. Mechanical trap. So what does that mean? What does that mean? So, well, what if it's not so much of a, like a trap per se? What if it's more the bridge is actually part of something mechanical. 
Like I said in the last episode that the bridge didn't seem to make sense that it would exist over the energy barrier. If the energy barrier is kind of supposed to let things, ships or whatever, in and out of the vault, it makes no sense for a bridge to be over it. So what if the bridge isn't normally there? So yeah, I think I think that's what we're going to go with. Archer and Luna are kind of stood looking over the edge and the floor begins to shake. The bridge begins to shake. But it's not a glitch this time. The bridge is moving and it's moving quickly because it is being folded in on itself and slowly disappearing towards the other side. Archer looks back to where the gap is, where the, the missing section is and the corresponding side is disappearing back in the direction of the eclipse and they're going to need to get off this thing before it disappears beneath their feet. Um, but is it going to be a roll? I, th I think it has to be, doesn't it? I think it was a weak hit, so I think that feeds into a roll. This And this feels like another face danger to me and I think essentially they don't really have any other option than to flat out sprint towards the other side. There's nothing in the environment that's going to help them. They don't have any tools that will help them. All they can do is hit the gas. So that's what they're going to do. They, they're they seeing that the floor is quickly receding beneath them. They put their heads down and they run for their lives. So we are going to face danger, acting with speed, mobility or agility, or probably all three of those, to be honest. So we are going to be rolling plus edge. A strong hit. So yes, a very timely strong hit. On a strong hit, you are successful and mark progress. So up to six out of ten, we are getting there. So Archer and Luna are just booking it. Absolutely showing a clean set of heels to the bridge that is folding up rapidly behind them. But because they kind of got a good jump, they got ahead of it and by just enough to reach the steps on the other side before they fall to their deaths. And the steps on the other side mirror the ones they ascended. They are steep and wide and as such they kind of, they make for slow going, but they manage to get down. And I think Archer kind of steps off to safety just seconds before the last step disappears. They are across. There is no longer a bridge, just the energy barrier where the floor should be, and nothing but deep space below them. And Luna is like doubled over, kind of catching her breath, and Archer, who's in significantly worse shape, um, collapses to the floor, wheezing, sweating under his mask, his shoulder is killing him, and his eyes scrunch closed in pain. But when... He opens his eyes again. He is blinded by the glare of blazing sunlight. He sits up in a panic to find there is no black iron beneath him. Just rock and sand. The glassy black spires stretch up and out in the distance. And they wobble in the heat haze. A figure stands before him. It's the shadow, standing just a few metres away, hood up, pale skin peering out from beneath the dark grey robes. They move their hands purposefully in front of their body, in an unusual motion, tracing something out, sweeping fluid motions using their whole body, a graceful, elegant dance. An archer is mesmerized just watching this happen hypnotized and it kind of brings him this quiet moment of peace watching this this beautiful movement in silence the shadow performing this almost balletic series of slow deliberate movements but then that moment is broken by luna who pulls archer to his feet by his jacket and he is back in the vault and Luna is looking ready to slap him back into the present again and he kind of puts his hands out to stop her to assure her that he is back and she kind of looks a bit disappointed that she doesn't get to slap him again um, and she motions for them to, to get moving but but Archer is, is looking down at the floor and Luna is kind of getting impatient she says Archer come on let's move and he 
kind of puts his hand up to give her the, the signal for her to wait. He's looking at the coppery gold inlay that, that runs throughout the structure like veins through the black iron. These patterns that make no sense. He's starting to get it. He looks at the patterns and thinks about what he has just seen the shadow doing. That unusual fluid motion. And something in his head starts to make sense. And I'm going to let the game interrupt here for a hot second. In the book it says the vault has an exterior, an interior and a sanctum. When you reach the sanctum, you discover the vault's purpose. And the book also says, if you undertake an expedition into a vault, you can use the progress track as a gauge for your current location. Once you reach six or more filled progress boxes, you have reached the sanctum. Now, as we debated at length last episode, we're not undertaking an expedition, but there's something about this rule that I like, um, and I'd like to show a bit of flexibility and bring that interpretation of the rules into play here. This place is a ring. This has been bothering me for a week, right? (laughs) This place is ring-shaped. It's circular. It's hard to have a linear progression through a vault shaped like a donut, right? Um, And reach a physical sanctum because what? They're going to walk all the way around it and reach the sanctum, which is just before the place where they parked the ship. Um, Because they could have just gone the other direction and found it right away. And that kind of doesn't really make any sense. So I've kind of been mulling this over. And I think that the sanctum in speech marks in this instance is less tangible. It's less a physical place. And it's more a kind of a state of understanding that Archer reaches. And kind of figuring out what this place is. And he has to physically explore it to figure that out, right? But but this vault sort of is the sanctum. Once he has figured out the purpose, he can find what he needs. He needs to find an iron gate and get them out to, to get them out of this vault and out of the spine of Kronos. And I think Archer's figured it out. So Archer looks up at Luna and says, we have to move now. And he kind of pushes past her and Luna says, I literally just said that. And she chases after him, kind of annoyed, and he's moving with purpose. No caution this time, breaking into a steady jog as as the vault once again returns to being this kind of large, featureless, endless stretch of black iron. Occasionally Archer stops to inspect a part of the detailing, kind of stooping down to, to touch it, to study it, much to Luna's visible impatience and annoyance. And I think what we're going to do here is, because Archer is kind of starting to apply some theory to this exploration, I think um, we can make another move. I think he's trying to piece together his observations with the vision he just had. And I I think that's going to be a move. So I think that's going to be secure and advantage, which says when you assess a situation, make preparations or attempt to gain leverage within a scene challenge, envision your action and role. And this is definitely going to be using expertise, focus, and observation. So rolling plus wits. A strong hit. Nice. So we are successful. On a strong hit, we can take both two momentum and plus one on our next move. So we're up to nine momentum now, which is pretty good. And we have that little plus one stimmy for the next move, which is very, very nice. So I think that after after kind of studying these bits and pieces as he's, he's moving around the vault, Archer is now 100% certain that his theory is correct and that he has divined the purpose of this vault. And he is kind of like a man possessed, like seemingly oblivious of any dangers, kind of lost in his thoughts, lost in the pursuit of an answer. And, and Luna's starting to get anxious about this. like as And the vault glitches again. Let's say the vault just kind of like flickers and kind of allows them to to see the Leviathan passing below through the smoky glass and just to kind of remind them that, you know, time is of the essence, right? Um, So I feel like we're kind of moving towards the home stretch now. So what we're going to do is we're going to roll up some details in the Oracle to see if we can kind of give this last section of the exploration like a, a bit more flavor. So let's see what we got. 27 is incomprehensible architecture or geometry okay and 
80 foes stand down or give way okay so so those two they kind of work nicely together and i think i think archer senses luna's apprehension and with enough of an idea now he decides yeah like they they better get a move on and and they do they they put a spurt on and they hustle their way around the vault and they do so and then they reach a part that is unlike the other sections they reach a section of the vault that stops them dead in their tracks because the next section of the way is cavernous as usual and black iron as usual but it is lined by two rows of columns each column stands about 20 meters high and atop each column is a sentinel made from the exact same forms as before their blocky geometric shapes in a rough humanoid form each one stands this time tall and proud in the exact same pose watchful silent and still luna pauses but archer slowly leads them on stepping carefully between the rows of columns watching for movement watching for a sign if they do somehow spring to life there will be no escape there'll be nowhere to run and nowhere to hide but this is the only way they have to move through the vault so they must press on and they pass dozens of these columns but there's no sign of any movement from the sentinels and archer and luna are so focused on watching for a flicker of life from these things that they barely notice how the environment changes suddenly in front of them the floor has risen up and they find themselves suddenly on what appears to be a staircase moving up and forward but it doesn't make any sense because the perspective makes it feels like they're actually moving down and then they see another staircase and more columns coming from all directions all made of the same material and it's hard to kind of ascertain what is what and luna has to stop herself toppling over the edge as she nearly steps out into what would have been a fatal fall archer holds her by the arm and gives her the signal to wait to pause and they do and even though they are standing still they are moving the floor is moving rising rhythmically slowly up and down turning it's hard to kind of figure out what's going on at first but everything is moving in a kind of weird synchronization in this sort of clockwork rhythm and that's when archer figures it out they aren't standing on stairs these are gears they are standing on the cog teeth of some huge incomprehensible bit of machinery and he stops to watch the movement to kind of plot a way through and he and luna cautiously step from piece to piece as the parts of this machine relentlessly move endlessly on they're carried up and through the inner workings of this thing by these massive turning grinding bits of black iron they duck under sections that appear from nowhere then step off onto a column as it glides up from a smooth surface to meet them and it takes all of their concentration to pick their way through and but they make it they make it safely across through whatever this strange machine is and on the other side they can see that the vault returns to its normal shape and form but once again is lined on either side by dozens more columns stretching out all topped with dozens more sentinels in any other circumstances this would be an awe inspiring sight and they can kind of feel it they can both instinctively feel that they are getting closer they are on the home stretch they can somehow feel instinctively their way out of this strange place and that the eclipse is not far away but then the whole structure glitches again pulsing with a powerful energy that is stronger than anything they have felt so far this was a big one and it shakes them both to the ground cracks are starting to appear all around them and as they begin to move 
between the columns, between the watchful sentinels guarding the way, those very columns begin to crack at their bases and begin to fall. One by one, like dominoes, they collapse inward, and Archer and Luna will have to run. So we're going to face danger once again, and we're really just going to be hooning it down this last stretch, trying to avoid these toppling columns. And remember, we do get a plus one from before, um, so this is certainly in our favour, he says, touching wood, crossing fingers, and holding a rabbit's paw. So we're going to be using speed and mobility, so we will be rolling plus edge. Well, I would right to cross my fingers because because not only is that a strong hit, that is a strong hit with a match, um, which in this context says on a strong hit, you're successful to mark progress. Great. But on a strong hit with a match, you get to mark progress twice. So that puts us all the way up to 10 out of 10. That has escalated quickly. <laughs> um, so uh, we actually have to um, make the progress move now because our progress track is filled completely. And that actually triggers the move, finish the scene. And finish the scene says, when the scene challenge tension clock or progress track is filled or events lead to the scene's conclusion, roll the challenge dice and compare to your progress. So we are at 10 progress. We're at maximum here. So again, I don't want to tempt fate. Anything other than tens, and we have got a strong hit on our hand. If we roll a 10 or two tens, that's a weak hit or a miss. And that's very unlikely, but it's just the kind of thing that would happen to me. So, um, yes, fingers crossed that we don't want tens. Um, and we can't use our momentum on progress moves. Um, so we are wholly at the mercy of the dice. So let's do this. <sighs> okay, so, uh, sigh of relief. That's a strong hit. Um, banana skin avoided and we achieve our objective unconditionally okay with a strong hit i think we need to bring this to a close in suitably cool fashion so the columns are toppling one by one they're falling and the, the first few are like close like they avoid them by a few meters as they kind of crash into the floor they kind of shatter into these pieces but they start to pick up pace as Archer and Luna start to pick up pace and they start to miss them by a smaller and smaller amount each time. The Sentinels are tumbling to the ground in the space that Archer and Luna just vacated every time. They're just outpacing it and they sprint through the chaos as each of the columns falls, crashing down behind them in an almighty avalanche of metallic carnage. But they get clear. They get clear, they avoid being crushed to death by falling metal. And Luna has outpaced Archer the whole way as they run and run. And it takes them a good minute to realise that they're fully clear because they're that focused on just running and running and running. And it's kind of only clear to them that they're safe when they stop running and are greeted by a familiar sight. The eclipse is hanging in the air, suspended off the ground, exactly where they left it, what seems like weeks ago. And Luna is so relieved to see it and makes her way quickly towards it. And like before, when they stepped off, it seems to lower somehow as she approaches as if the force holding it in place is responding to her. As she gets closer, the landing rope comes down and Cole eagerly ascends, clearly pleased to see them returning safely. Luna stops at the foot of the ramp, holding her sides, because she's got like an almighty stitch from all this running, right? And all the kind of evading of falling metal that she's been doing recently. It's been a real workout. And she turns to see Archer, but he's not running. He's not approaching at all. He's stooping he's looking down at his feet moving in a crouch around the area where the eclipse is once again kind of studying the patterns on the floor tracing them with his fingers following them along the ground and up the walls into the ceilings of this great ancient structure and cole says what is he doing and luna says i have no idea and then Cole shouts, Barlow, did you find it? 
Did you find the gate? Because that's why we're here, right? But we didn't find the gate. But Archer figured out the purpose of this vault after his vision. And that purpose is... 46. Manipulation of space-time. And Archer begins to move his hand slowly, gracefully, in exactly the way the shadow did in his vision. And Cole does not understand, and he's kind of starting to panic, and he shouts again, Barlow, did you find the gate? And the floor around Archer begins to glow, the coppery gold inlays coursing with energy, transforming the shiny black surface all around them into a pulsing network of white and yellow light. And Archer says, No, I didn't find the gate. This place is the gate. And the entire structure starts to move. Outside, the Leviathan passes through the clouds of whirling dust as the giant blue crystalline structure of the vault begins to change colour, pulsing with yellow light as it tips up onto its side and the inner ring becomes a swirling mass of orange and gold. There is a blinding flash, followed by an earth-shaking sonic boom, as the vault shatters into a billion tiny pieces. Thank you, thank you, thank you a million times. Thank you for watching. Please like this video, subscribe if you've not done so already, and click the little bell icon so you can be notified as soon as the next video drops. And please do check out the Bad Spot Patreon where you can find all kinds of cool perks and really support the work I'm doing. I'll be back next week, but until then, it's farewell and safe passage.